As odd as it might sound, one of the most important factors in helping the theology and faith of our church grow was actually heretical movements. Because nothing forces you to get the right answer, quite like hearing lots of wrong ones. While originating and becoming abundantly present in the early church, heresy is by no means a thing of the past. A look to our world today shows five major heresies alive and well. This is Catholicism in Focus. Before we get to the list, it's important to understand what we mean by heresy. If you're unfamiliar with its technical definition or would like a refresher, you can pause the video and click here for a previous episode. Otherwise, here we go. Number one, Arianism. Not to be confused with Arianism. In the early church, there were many questions about who Jesus was. Is he God? Is he human? How did his natures relate? Finding the correct language to express what we believe took centuries, and many insufficient answers were proposed in the process. One of these insufficient answers came from Arius, a 4th century Alexandrian priest. For Arius, Jesus was begotten by the Father, the first among creation, but was not co-eternal or consubstantial with him, meaning that he was ultimately a creature. He might have been a perfect human, but he was not fully God which is a problem. In our modern day, there are overt examples of Arianism, as in the case when people outright deny the divinity of Christ and say that he was merely a holy man or a good teacher. But there are also more subtle examples, as in the case when Jesus is made subordinate to the Father or not quite as powerful, as if there were a hierarchy in God. Like, Jesus is important, but the Father's the one who's really in charge. In order to be truly divine, Jesus must be of the exact same substance and authority as the Father and the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, there would be something lacking or secondary in him, which would, by definition, make him not God. Number two, docetism. In this heresy, what we find is the opposite of Arianism. Rather than denying the divinity of Christ, adherents of docetism deny the humanity of Christ. For them, Jesus did not actually take on human flesh or have a human nature. He only appeared to, like a phantasm or hologram-type being, and thus he did not actually experience suffering and death. The reason for this is because all matter is seen to be unequivocally evil, while the spirit is unequivocally good. Jesus did not come to redeem creation, our bodies in the physical world, but instead came to free us from the corruption of creation. Think of Jesus as a sort of spy, disguised in sneaking behind enemy lines to show us a way out. This sort of duality and negative view of the flesh does not have a single founder or proponent, but this heresy has served to be quite pervasive in history and has cropped up numerous times in numerous places. In ancient times, this included Gnostic groups and the Manichaeans, and today we see this in any spirituality that denies the importance of our bodies and sees them as sinful, doesn't believe that God created the world and that it's wholly good, or wants salvation without sacrifice. Also, the Matrix. Number three. Monophysitism. If we deny these first two heresies and accept that Jesus is fully God and fully human, we are naturally led to a bigger question. How do these natures relate to one another? The Monophysites, those who believe in monophusis, literally one nature, argued that after the Incarnation, Jesus was either only divine or some combination of human and divine, but ultimately just a single nature. In response, the Council of Chalcedon taught that not only did Jesus have two natures, human and divine, but that these natures were without confusion, without change, without division, without separation, the difference of the natures being by no means removed because of the union. In other words, Jesus was not half human and half divine, but fully both, and his divine nature did not override or dissolve the other. Even today, Christ exists in heaven with both a human and divine nature. On an explicit level, this is arguably the most common heresy today, as it's actually the official stance of six Eastern Orthodox churches, communities that refuse to accept the teaching of the Council and maintain that Jesus is of one nature. Naturally, they have their reasons for dissent, but for Catholics, most of Eastern Orthodoxy and Protestant Christians, it is a heresy. That said, some have argued that it is even more prevalent on an implicit level, influencing the theological imagination of the majority of Christians. When push comes to shove, most people will almost always defer to Christ's divinity at the expense of his humanity. Could Jesus have spoken Mandarin Chinese even before it existed? Flown to the moon? Made electricity fly out of his fingers like the emperor? Well, of course, people say, he's God. Without realizing it, many slip into heresy, denying the two equally important and never overshadowed natures of Jesus. Number four, 
Pelagianism. As the name indicates, this heresy was first proposed in the 4th century by a British theologian named Pelagius and at its core deals with the question of salvation and free will. For Pelagius, sin exists in the world, but it does not affect one's ability or desire to choose the good. For this reason, no help is needed in doing what is right. We have everything within us to achieve our salvation. While this might sound nice at first, it ultimately leads to a major problem. If we are completely within our power to achieve salvation, that means we don't need Jesus, and his life, death, and resurrection serve as nothing more than good examples to follow. Today, we won't find many people defending Pelagius outright, but there are definitely those who adhere to his ideas. We see this when people claim that being a good person will get us to heaven, or that doing good works, helping the poor, or prayer in any way earn justification. If we believe that our actions, rather than the actions of Jesus, are what save us, we have fallen into heresy. Finally, and somewhat anticlimactically, we get to number five, Donatism, a topic for which I have already done an entire video, and so I'm gonna recommend that you click this link and we'll move to the closing. Why does any of this matter? For some, it might seem like a waste of time to focus so much of our attention on these technical details and even a bit uncharitable to tell people that their beliefs are wrong. Wouldn't Jesus prefer that we just see him in the way that makes sense to us and be tolerant of other perspectives? No. No, he would not. You see, Jesus is not a projection of our hopes and dreams. He's not simply an expression of our own selves relative to what we think or how we feel. Jesus is a real being. He actually did and said certain things, has certain qualities particular to himself. Truth does exist, and God wants us to know it. In saying that someone professes heresy, we are not saying that they are a bad person or that they're necessarily going to hell, only that they are in error about who God really and truly is. But that doesn't mean that we're okay to remain in error or to let others continue to profess something that is completely false. While we can certainly accept the fact that we don't know everything about him, and there certainly can be various legitimate spiritualities regarding the significance of his life, death, and resurrection, we can say that we know some things. To say something about him that goes directly against what God has revealed, or to allow someone to continue to believe something that we know is false, does not benefit anyone. How we address this issue is a topic that has been debated for centuries, but the fact of addressing it is not in question. As faithful people who want to know God, we have an obligation to uphold the truth, even if others won't accept it.